<laughs> Tammy always uh, reminds me. Um, so we have a good crowd today, Michael. We have about 10 people, which is a good number. We don't want to, you know, we, we'll have time to talk at the end. We'll have questions. Um, I just want to cover some few uh, housekeeping. Hey, Shelly joined us. Shelly. Uh, just a, house, a few housekeeping things that I want to just cover first. I want to put the link to uh, the, oops, I got the wrong link. I want to get the. I want to put the link on, on the chat so that you all have the um, uh, the the schedule of all the workshops. So I'm going to copy that right now. I had the wrong link. Let me just grab it real quick. And so basically, what we're doing is we there's three parts. We're going to today we're doing pre-production, and the next one will be production, and last the third will be post-production. And for each workshop, we're going to schedule two dates, uh, you know, for those who can make it in the morning and those who can make it in the afternoon. We have two, two different scheduled dates for each workshop. So we're going to cover the same thing twice. Um, if, if you're free to come to both, it's up to you. I mean, we have a lot of, I mean, I'm having fun with Michael. I don't know if you can come <laughs> if you want, as much as you want. So I'm not stopping you. Uh, but basically, that's what we've scheduled. We have you know, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So we're doing two, uh, uh, the same workshop, we're doing it twice for those who can make it in the morning and then in the afternoon, we'll do it again. Um, so feel free to come to both if you like. Uh, for the summer, we have a total of seven workshops uh, that are mainly focused on the flip classroom model. Uh, we're taking attendance. And if you do attend all seven, we are giving a certificate badge uh, to those who attend all seven workshops. So it was nice to have, you know, if, if you're interested in that. Um, so, uh, Michael, uh, you want to go ahead and, and for those who don't know you, can you tell them a little bit about yourself uh, and, and what you teach at FIT, how long you've been at FIT? Um, I started at FIT in 1991 and uh, I started with a multimedia presentation class, which was appropriate. And um, uh, today I teach uh, all our computer uh, application classes, mainly Microsoft Office and a lot of data type classes, and um, our video production classes. And uh, the, the curriculum has really, you know, the technology has changed so much in the, uh, you know, the 23, 24 years I've been at FIT. And, uh, you know, I think that that's something that I really embrace, the way that the communication technologies and the delivery methods and the production techniques have really changed. And um, it's become so much more accessible for students to produce video. And I know you guys, you know, you're all in your home studios now, um, you know, working on uh, being a video producer. You know, years ago when I started in the industry, I worked at Gannett Productions um, as a assistant editor. That's how I got my start, really. and you know, there you had to, you know, rent a room for $300. You wanted to do audio. You had to pay more money for that. You wanted titles with that. Oh, you, you want fries with that? You want titles too? You got to, you know, <laughs> wheel in the title guy and have to pay more for that. Now you can do all this, you know, on one platform. You know, you can do it on your phone. And so, it, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how the technology has really changed and it's just become so much more accessible. On the other hand, the, you know, the technique and the foundations a lot are still the same and even if you don't have a lot of that under your belt and you don't know how to manipulate it even with uh, high-end technology and the ease of use you can kind of slip a little bit and uh, you know your communication can become a lot less effective you know think about a lot of those uh, considerations so it, it, it's an interesting thing that's come full circle yeah I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that Michael because um, uh, the, how 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 technology with video production now, especially what we just went through this past Mar you know for, since March we've been working remotely, and so video has really become an important piece of this big puzzle that we're trying to si solve as educators. And the other thing that you you mentioned, which I think is super important, is just you know back then it was you know you had it take several years of editing and or you know really had to spend a lot of time it was very difficult to actually do any type of editing and what we now see you mentioned this earlier you said you know there's now you can even edit on your mobile phone which is amazing and not only that but the fact that that these companies have realized how 
important it is to learn how to produce content like video at different levels of expertise. So you don't really have to be an expert editor. You know, you can grab your phone. You can you can go on the computer, do some Adobe Spark video. You know, that are at the basic level that you don't really need all the bells and whistles whistles to to really produce something that looks high production, but you know, pretty good actually. You know, pretty good quality video at uh, minimal time. Um, and so we're going to talk a lot about that in, in today's workshop. Uh, I just <clears> want to uh, mention that we are going to present for the, about 45 minutes, and then we'll, we have about half an hour to an hour at the end. And if you want to stay, feel free to stay. We're going to do more, a little bit of hands-on, um, because what's going to happen is we're going uh, – today's workshop is really going to be uh, touching on the fundamentals and basics, but we are going to get our hands dirty. We're going to eventually, in, by workshop number two, we are all going to uh, create our own either introduction video to your course, or if you're interested in creating a lecture video presentation, we're actually going to do that um, by workshop number two. And we, we're all going to come out here making at least one video by the end of the third workshop. And uh, we, we're going to uh, create a Padlet exhibition where we all can put our videos and we can all you know, exhibit what we produced you know, uh, working on with, together as a group in this workshop. And it'll be a fun way to learn about video and, and talk informal, you know, about video production. But then also we'll get our hands, our feet wet and create some, act some actual videos that you can actually use in your, in your course. Uh, so let me share the screen real quick so that Michael and I can uh, begin our presentation. And we'll, we'll have time for questions too at the end. All these uh, recordings will be placed on that link that I put there on the Adobe Spark page that we are that I shared with you in the chat room. Um, and so here we go. So uh, Michael, uh, you know, storyboarding, like we mentioned, video is becoming a big deal now. I mean, it's always been a big deal, but I think even more so now in education, you know, with online teaching and also, oops, I think I hear a question. Yeah, Jean, Jean De Niro has a question, right? Jean? Jean, you have a question? Got to turn your mic on, maybe, Jean? No question. I just did that in error. Sorry. Oh, no worries. No worries. No worries. <laughs> so, so, Michael, you know, as, as we're going through remote teaching, we noticed how, how, how important video has been for, for faculty now, you know, uh, now that we're teaching, we were teaching remote for this past, you know, two semesters, you know, how uh, we had to record our lectures. Students could then watch them at their own time. They can rewind, pause, and, and all that good stuff. And now I'm getting a lot of feedback from faculty now that we're going back into the face-to-face, -face, you know, how can I use video to teach? And, you know, one of the things that we've been promoting is you know some the flip classroom model where uh, you you record your videos ahead of time, students can watch them at their own time, and when they come into the classroom, you have freed up the lecture time to then do more of you know how you know think, helping the students where they need help the most. And so, uh, you want to talk, Mike, a little bit about how this past you know, through the, through the remote teaching process, how, ha how has video really changed the way that you teach? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, uh, the idea of a, a hybrid class where you can really give students a, uh, a primer in um, a lot of the important foundational things that they can, you know, digest, ingest at their own pace through video really kind of uh, gives them the foundation when they walk into the classroom, you can use that subsequent live face-to-face -face time much more effectively um, instead of going over, you know, the kind of basic things. They've already got that under their belt and it all, you know, kind of whets their appetite, that, that mm -hmm. uh, primer for them. So they, they kind of know what to expect walking in the classroom. Um, you don't mm -hmm. have to start, you know, from scratch. Uh, they know the direction that you're, you're going and they know some of the foundation is laid already. So I think that's, that's really effective. Um, you know, uh, I hope that, that answers the question pretty well. Yeah, I, I, I've always seen flip classroom, I used to use the analogy as a, as a baseball coach would record the fundamentals, right? Like, you know, if, if I'm going to teach a, a, a young kid to, you know, throw and catch the ball, 
instead of spending all the time teaching the fundamentals, I can really record that at one time, have my kids watch the those videos and the fundamentals. And then when I take them back, when I, they come back into you know the, the the practice, then I can really look to see where who needs the most help. So I can really dedicate the time to those who are struggling. Uh, you know, because you always have those students who are really some some of which are ahead of the game. They're much more advanced, and then others who are a little bit behind. And so this will allow you to kind of spend a little time on those who are you know, struggling and, and you know, and help them catch up to the other the other kids. Right. And they can use those archive videos also to help catch up so that, you know, you don't have to kind of re-explain so many times during class. If, you know, you have a good archive and someone says, well, you know, how do you do that step again? How do you make those tabs mm -hmm. in Word or set up a chart in Excel? You've got those little videos that they can go back to. And then the, the, the kids who are, you know, doing fine, again, uh, instead of the remedial kind of things, you can take them to the next level too, because you have that extra time. So I think that's that's effective too. To, you know, think about you know, obviously you got a class of students, they're all over the place. You've got that bell curve. You know, you've got uh, some of them who are excelling already, and uh, they want to go further. And typically there's there's you know room for them. And if you have the time in that face to face meeting, you really can uh, you know let them excel in that, as long as they've they've got the foundation. Right, right. A, a, a good starting point, Michael, for somebody new to doing to creating video content. Uh, you recommend storyboarding to them? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think storyboarding is crucial. Um, you can't go without it in the industry. It is a tool that is tried and tested. It's expected, whether it's a you know six-second YouTube bumper or a two-hour Hollywood film, um, and it doesn't have to be the most uh, elaborately, you know, artistically drawn storyboard. As long as you understand um, your ideas, it helps you to formulate your ideas, to sequence your ideas, to structure your your message. Um, I also find that it's an excellent communication tool if you're working with a crew. So, for instance, you can show your camera operator, this is what I have in mind. Um, even when you're working with a client. Uh, someone has an idea and they're paying you to work on a video, um, you can kind of kick it around on paper where it doesn't cost a lot of money and um, you can make changes before you walk into a studio and start, you know, actually spending time and money to produce it so that, you know, you can make a lot of the corrections early on and make all the approvals. Everybody's happy on paper and then we go and produce it. And I think that's it's a very effective way to work with storyboarding. So we, I always have my students storyboard all of their work in, my, in our video class. Mm -hmm. It's the first step, and they're graded on that too. I mean, you know. And the other thing that I think is interesting is a really effective piece looks very similar in its finished video edit as it did in the mm -hmm. storyboard. In other words, if you've got that plan down, you're not being creative so much while you're in the studio, you know, because you've already planned it on paper. And again, being creative in the studio is fine, but it tends to cost more money. You can't be like, well, let's try it this way. Let's try it that way. You've already kind of you know, experimented on paper. And I think that it's a really effective way to kind of uh, fine tune your workflow. That's a great point you make about planning ahead and saving time in the long, in the long run. Um, from the teacher's perspective, I like looking at storyboarding of, of a way to chunk your videos because um, studies have shown that, you know, between five to seven minutes, it's a good amount of time for, for, you know, maintaining the attention span and also for the students to absorb the content. Um, and so when, when we talk about chunking, what we're really talking about is uh, taking, let's say, a two-hour lecture presentation that you normally would have in a classroom. And this is what most professors are used to, right? We're, 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 we have this mindset that we have two hours, we got to use up those two hours, and we got to fill up those two hours with, you know, the, the material that we have to present to the class. And so when we're dealing with video, you're going to kind of have to break out of that mindset. Are you doing this here now? Oops. Uh, let me, <laughs> I'm going to mute everyone because I just want to make sure the audio is clean. Uh, let me mute. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, Michael, just if you can turn on your microphone. Sorry about that. Um, so going back to chunking, right? Uh, so if you're going to chunk your videos to about five to seven minutes, what uh, what I'm referring to, I'm not trying to say that you have to take those two hours of lecture time 
and put them in five minute in one five minute video. That's not what we're saying here. Uh, what you normally would do is you would take let's say a two hour lecture and then you'll break it down to maybe seven or eight short videos in a sequence of order of right, right. Uh, um, Michael yeah. yeah I think that and, atomizing you know the atomizing um, really helps students to you know it's again you, you look at a table of contents and you want to jump to a certain area like you know you understand the, the basics and you can you can go right to the, the intermediate thing so the idea that they can really atomize it and say, well, I'm comfortable with that, you know, let mm -hmm. me work on something that I'm not as comfortable with, and they can then really optimize their experience like that. Exactly. It goes back to what you said earlier, Michael, about YouTube-esque. I never, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to start using that now. <laughs> but it's, again, the same idea as YouTube videos. They're, you know, straight to the point, quick, and, you know, it's just, you're short, shorter than normal uh, two-hour videos. And so having a, having a story, having to storyboard and plan, you can then take those learning objectives that you have planned for that two hour lecture and break them into chunks. And so let's say you're covering uh, learning objective one, you know, you'll do that first video learning objective two, and then you'll break them up that way with the storyboard. Uh, and so we included links. And by the way, this I got to give attribution to Columbia University because this a lot of the content that I pulled into this presentation is coming from their uh, video best practices. Great content too. Yeah, yeah. And I found out some of it is mine actually when I was there. <laughs> this, like, like this one right here, I know I created this example storyboard. But um, but feel free to click on this uh, these links. And, and Michael, you also have some resources if you don't like this. If you don't like this um, template for storyboarding, I think Michael, you mentioned there was a couple of the websites you had before. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, there's this storyboarder.com, which is a you know a pretty popular one, and you can get a free account and get started with that. Um, you can just use PowerPoint or Google Slides too. Uh, you can set PowerPoint or Google Slides up to uh, you know view it as a kind of storyboard view where you have your image area and then you have your audio area. Uh, where you have your dialogue and uh, any other, like music or sound effects. The nice thing about doing it with Google and PowerPoint is that you can build in networking and collaboration features. So if you are working with a team or you have your students work with a team, which is also very effective, you know, to have students work together, um, they can be, you know, uh, discussing their ideas online before class, you know, fine tuning, making suggestions amongst themselves. So this way, when they come into class and they're presenting or actually executing, they've already got all of this under their belt. And I, you know, I've seen this. Um, it, it can be a big time waster where all of a sudden somebody pops out and says, "Hey, you know, let's try something different or let's try it this way." And they, you know, we're in the studio. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've got technicians, we've got equipment, we've got you know, people are paying five hundred dollars an hour in a commercial studio to do this. So you don't really want to be sitting around saying, "Oh, you know, let's." Let's let's trash that idea and try it this way because you're going to be wasting time and we don't have that resource in there. So I think that's yeah. another really effective way to, to use a storyboard collaboratively. Um, and, you know, there's lots of different formats. You can design your own. You can even do it in Word. It actually works fine or on paper, you know, get a yeah. cocktail napkin. <laughs> but again, yeah, planning is planning will definitely save you time, especially if if you're gonna chunk your videos into small, you know, bite-sized videos that uh, you don't you want to make sure you cover everything that you want to cover in your lecture. And this is one. This is an example of a storyboard. You know, you can, you know, this could be your slides if that's what you're presenting. And then next to the slide, you can either have you know talking points or your script. And scripting is the next thing that we're going to cover. Let me go back over here, Michael. What do, what do you think about scripting? Well, you know, to me, in in this uh, realm, scripting is really your lesson plan. I mean, that's what it is. It's the idea of kind of taking your lesson plan that you would normally disseminate in a, say, a face-to-face -face class, and then scripting it for video. So mm -hmm. you're kind of thinking about how. Um, the different delivery method of someone, instead of being right in front of you, watching this on a screen where you're not there, maybe asynchronously, um, how um, they're going to, again, be able to, uh, you know, acclimate the material and uh, be comfortable with it. So the script really is the, you know, the guidelines of, say, in a, in a lesson plan, all the things I want, you know, to cover. So I'll look at my, you know, sometimes I work backwards. I'll say, well, 
after this video, I want students to have, you know, uh, a comfortable working knowledge of these learning objectives. And then I'll work my way back to, you know, how I'm going to get them there. And even, even starting out with why they should want to get there. So something like maybe even building in a, a storyline in your script where you have a beginning, middle, and end. And the beginning is, well, why is it effective to learn to do uh, a pivot table in Excel? And, uh, you know, how can that make you a better marketer or something like that? And then how to do it, you know, step by step how to do it. And then, you know, the idea of the mastery at the end and what you can really do with it then. You know, how, can you, how you can put it to a real world use. So this kind of, you know, beginning, middle and end. And I think a script really helps you with that. Um, again, it's part of the plan. It goes hand in hand. To me, a script and a storyboard, um, they're both scripts. You know, one is just a more visual look at it. The first, uh, you know, you might want to work on your first script where you just like lay it out as far as text. You know, this is what I want to accomplish. And then you work with that script and say, along with, you know, when I'm, you know, saying this narration, what am I going to be showing that's going to mm -hmm. synchronize with what I'm saying and reinforce it to the point where it's going to make that, you know, connection much better. Yeah, you, there's a lot of important things you mentioned there. I just want to break down a couple of those things that you, uh, Michael, that you just mentioned. Uh, the first thing you mentioned was a narrative, like having a, a narrative arc, right? Beginning, middle, and end. Uh, for teachers, that beginning could be that lesson hook, right? Once we get the student's attention. So putting that in the script and, and, and putting it in your storyboard, again, that's again, planning ahead of time, having a nice lesson hook, get them, get them interested. Once they bite the, the the worm, now you got them, right? And then, then you go to the middle, and then you transition now to a, you know, at the end, maybe a slow reflection piece on what did we just cover and, and, and those things. I also love that you said, um, um, you, you talked a little bit about uh, um, uh, this, having the script and um, having it uh, match the content that you're trying to, te you know, the, what you're teaching. And and so uh, uh, the the script can can be can easily be your if let's say for example you're teaching with slides, um, and you, and you have talking points on your slides, and and you feel like that could be your script. You can also work that way. I've seen a lot of professors who uh, you know keep their slides not too text heavy and just use those cues to then um, you know remind them of what they need to say at that moment in time. So you can also think of it that way. And another thing too, Michael, that you mentioned, which caught my attention was that um, also you have to be careful with scripts, right? You don't want to sound monotone. You don't want to sound like you're reading. So I've seen faculty who read off the teleprompter and they're just, you know, just reading and it doesn't sound engaging. So also keep those things in mind. I, I always tell, I always, whenever I'm doing a video, I, I try to either practice in front of a mirror and see how I'm sounding that doesn't sound like I'm reading it from a piece of paper or something. Right. And, right. And, and Michael, and also if you are going to use something to read, don't use a piece of paper because I remember working with some uh, faculty and, you know, that have a piece of paper and you hear that, the, the, the paper in the back, you know, you don't want, and we'll talk about sound later, but, but um, again, uh, also we're gonna have another guest speaker. I think by the second workshop, somebody from the uh, Stephen Keaton, Steve Keaton from the writing and speech department. He's gonna come in and, and talk to us a little bit about speech, speaking in front of a camera and having your slides. Uh, so he'll talk more in depth about uh, on those topics. So it'd be great to have Steven's expertise on speech. Right. And I think that's great. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things I notice when I, uh, say, observe a class or something and, uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. the instructor pulls out a PowerPoint on the projector, I can see right away the students, you know, if it's a good PowerPoint, they'll, they'll tune right in and they'll follow along with it. And like I said, right. a good PowerPoint is generally very visual. It right. doesn't have a lot of text. It has points where, you know, the, the instructor is going to be uh, following along conversationally, ad-libbing, and uh, a lot of the visuals are there to support that. If an instructor right. is mm -hmm. reading text off the slides, it's, right. uh, you know, a great way to kind of put the class to sleep because they can read way faster than you can. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're just going to be telling them once upon a time this is a PowerPoint slide, they're going to be asleep pretty quickly. So, exactly. Uh, yeah, I think the idea of really kind of knowing, and I, like you said, Jose, recording, is the best way to kind of see yourself and hear yourself 
the way your audience is seeing yourself in here, you know, so you can kind of then after your recording, sit back and watch it objectively and say, gee, you know, I'm not really making good eye contact here or I'm mm -hmm. redundant or whatever. So, it, you know, every time you do a video and you watch it yourself, it's a great way to kind of uh, get that feedback and say, you know what, next time I do it, I'm going to be more effective. I'm going to tighten it up. I'm going to, you know, tighten up my script and whatever it is. So feedback yeah, that's is a, critical. Th that's an excellent point, Michael, because, you know, as most professors, you know, we all usually teach in front of a classroom. And so I don't know about you all, but, you, you know, I, I feel like I get an adrenaline rush when I'm in front of an audience and I'm like, you know, it's like a blur to me by the end of the presentation. But like you're saying, Michael, you, know, you actually have a recording now of your of your lecture, and so you can actually go back and look and say, well, you know, I, I you know I, I forgot to say this, or maybe I could, like you're saying, I can tighten up my script, you know, or this joke fell flat, you know, maybe I'll try something else next time. So it's a it's a valuable not only for the students but for you as a teacher, it's a great way to look back and and reflect and say, oh, you know, next time I'll probably do this differently because I can I, I can tell you like it's so hard to even remember like what I said at the end of this presentation because it's just it's like an adrenaline you know rush. <laughs> And the great thing about video, too, is that you can, you know, just go in and re-edit your video. So, like, you know, if you if you made a video and it was okay, it was pretty good, students liked it, sometimes, you know, you'll watch it again and realize, hey, I, I could actually make this a little better. I can make it a little tighter. I can, you know, cut something out, add something in. So, you know, mm -hmm. the nice thing about this kind of production is it stays plastic. So, uh, you know, you can keep going in there and, you know, kind of fine tune it, keep making it more effective. And a lot of times it's also that feedback that you get from the class. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you put out a little survey or you ask people like, you know, what do you think about that video? And they'll be like, you know, I really liked it, but I, I wish you would have showed this. Well, okay, that's what I'm going to add in my next edit, you know. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to start from scratch every time. That's another great thing about it. You can say, you know, I'm just going to go in there and add something, maybe just add a little more voiceover or a couple of titles that will mm -hmm. just make it more clear to, you know, different students. And of course, you know, everybody learns differently. So just, you know, when you're polling a class of a lot of different people, um, you know, you'll get uh, different cues of what worked for them and what didn't work and those kind of suggestions. And I think that, you know, the idea of post-production, you, know, you know, you'll always have it. Once you've done your video, you can always keep fine tuning it. I'm glad you mentioned that, Michael, because that's exactly what we're going to learn in our next workshop is how to go back to that video, make some changes, splice, remove, add, insert, and you're all going to learn how to do that. And we're going to, you know, we're going to take our time. And in the second workshop, will be much more hands-on where we're all going to record a video, come back into our workshop, and then we're going to go ahead and make some edits. But I like the, I like the, what you said, Michael, about video is flexible. If you think about it, you, you know, once you're in that editing room, even if you filmed it, in a in a sequential order once you're in the edit room your your storytelling can change completely based on the way you move pieces around in your story right and so uh, and i really believe you know that this is a if you watch memento you right away can tell like this them whole movie is told by the editor right because the move things are happening where the, the sequence of the movie is completely changed based on the, the based on the editing right and so right. So such an and such an important powerful tool that you're going to have in your hands as to you know if you if you're listening to yourself say you know oh I have a lot of ums and ahs and I wish I had never said that there's a lot of room and space for flexibility you go back into your video you can remove it no one ever knew that was there you can <laughs> you know it's it's like magic you have this magic wand and you know this power that you can actually make things the way you want them. And so that's the power of editing. <laughs> Absolutely. They say editors make the best directors. You know, obviously uh, in a big production, everybody's doing their own thing. You have an editor, you have a uh, director, you have sound people. Um, when you're working alone like this, you're, you're wearing all the hats. You know, I'm the right. camera person, I'm the star, I'm the editor, I'm the writer, I'm, you know, I'm doing everything for my, my, my class video. But as an editor, um, if you kind of think backwards again, where you say to yourself, you know, what do I need in the finished product? And that's mm -hmm. again, going back to the storyboard, you know, where you say, well, this is all the stuff I need on paper. And then you can kind of work backwards and say, now, how am I going to acquire this footage or these screenshots or this narration 
that it's going to be effective than mm -hmm. and to put it together in the edit. And as you said, Jose, you don't have to do it in real time. You don't have to do it sequentially. You can do it for your own convenience. Um, you know, you can shoot the intro and the outro first, then shoot the middle, then shoot the demo, and then edit, you know, change the sequence and ordering in the edit process and really tighten it up. So, you know, again, the, you mentioned the power of editing, and it's just amazing how, uh, you know, it really is the, the ultimate tool. I mean, just think about, you know, you're writing something in a, in a word processor like Word, um, mm -hmm. and then you go in there and edit it. And, you mm -hmm. know, you can, you can change it like night and day, and it's the same thing right. with video right. editing. Right. It's not like the old days. We had a typewriter, and once you type those words, you had to go back. <laughs> correct. You need to correct the type, right? Correct the name. <laughs> or, 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 or what was it? A whiteout. You know. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself here. I'm like, yeah, I remember. Whiteout. Yeah, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so that's the power you have. We're gonna, you know, Michael and I are gonna walk you through that in workshop number two. We're gonna teach you how to do all these changes later on. Uh, Michael, I wanna quickly talk about. I wanna go too deep into this because. It, I mean, it's something that we do have to cover, but you know, at least we should mention a little, talk a little about about it. It's it's a cognitive overload, right? And this is not just only for video. I mean, it applies to anything. I mean, even teaching. If you're in front of the classroom and you, and you have your slides are up, and then you have a you know a graph on your slide, then you have some text, then you have images, and then you have transitions and effects. It's overkill, right, Michael? Uh, Having right. too much can really overload sensory, and it's a sensory overload, right? And and so, Michael, can you talk about, in, in, from a teacher's perspective, how do you avoid sensory overload so that your you know slides or whatever it is that you're presenting can can easily be, uh, I like to use the word digest, right? Students can digest right. it easily and understand and simplify what it is that you're trying to teach to them. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know. You, you, you don't want to overdo it because a lot of times what happens is they start to think more about the, the process, you know, and if you have a lot of distracting elements in there, they are not focusing on the real message. So you don't want to overdo, you know, the packaging too much. Um, certainly you want it to be polished, but when you have too many bells and whistles, it might be overload where, you know, people are thinking about when's the next special effect coming up and, you know, they're not really thinking about the content anymore. So you want to make sure that the the medium is not the message, right? The old Marshall mm -hmm. McLuhan quote that, that you know they're thinking really about the content and not about the the process. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I think a lot of times it's, it's the idea of focus and breaking it down. Um, so, you know, for instance, uh, in, using PowerPoint as an example, um, one of the things that I usually tell students when I look at their first PowerPoint is, well, you know, look at this slide here. You've got you know six bullets. You've got two pictures, you, you know, why don't you think about like, you know, taking those six bullets and making six separate slides and just run them a little quicker. So this way, when someone's looking at something on the screen, they're focused on that one concept and they're not like, you know, while you're talking about bullet number one, they're reading bullet number five. So right. just the idea of the way you kind of manipulate and kind of bring things on stage um, in the sequence, I think is really important. You know, yeah, talk Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jose. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to jump in there, Michael, and say it's like almost, you know, it's like a soft skill that students nowadays have to learn. You know, you have, you know, you have 30 seconds, that elevator pitch. Your boss is in the elevator. You walk in, you know, she's there. She's looking at you, and you go blank, and, and you don't know what to say, but you, you have to be able to articulate those thoughts. And this little graph that we have here is just basically showing, you know, uh, we talked, we're going to talk about audio and visuals. And so all of these uh, uh, sensories are, you know, students are absorbing the video, they're absorbing the visuals, they're absorbing the audio. Uh, and so, you know, you, you have to be careful. Um, and you mentioned slides, right? And so if you have slides and you, you're recording a video or you're teaching, you know, you're doing a screen grab, a screen capture. Uh, and so you can use the mouse and, you know, to, to pinpoint, to the where this where you want them to, to draw the attention right On, or right. call it a hot, a hot spot right we call it sometimes hot spots where then you know if you're talking about let's say this garment and you, you want to focus on the stitching you know you either zoom into the stitching or you can move the mouse if it's an image you can then move the cursor to where it is you want to uh, draw the attention or 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 have the students look at exactly what is you're speaking so that's what we're really talking about here too is also you know 
uh, uh, making it easier for them to understand through visuals and audio cues what right. they need to look at. And they can really focus on it. And I, you know, I think there's, there's an interesting concept that I think I, I see in a lot of authoring here, and it's something called producer's bias. Mm. It's something you have to be careful of. And what, what happens is you're such an expert in what you do and what you teach that a lot of times you don't realize, especially when you're putting together a presentation, that you really need to kind of take 10 steps back and really kind of break it down for a layperson. You can't take anything for granted. You have mm -hmm. to realize that students are coming to this with a totally different background experience than you might expect. So producer's bias has this idea like, oh, oh you didn't realize that? You know, like, mm -hmm. uh, of course you know, because you've been doing it for 20 years or whatever, and it's, you know, your day-to-day -day job, uh, you have to remember that when you're, you know, setting something up in a kind of media script like this, you really got to start from scratch. Um, yeah. And, you know, it depends. You can move faster. And, and then again, that goes back to the idea of, you know, getting students to uh, watch a lot of these things before they even come into the classroom so that they can have that basic foundational knowledge. And then you can really start, you know, en en enhancing it for them in the, in the live class. That's an excellent point, uh, Michael, because with video, uh, you can answer a lot of these questions that, you know, if you didn't, let's say, for example, you, you didn't go with video uh, and you, you assume they know the fundamentals and the basics. And so you're, you know, assuming that they know or that you don't need to cover that, you know, the, the, the basics. Uh, and then you have, you know, students uh, who clearly have preconceived misconceptions, right? They think that they, they know yeah. Uh, and right, and so uh, we all have those students, right? They they think they know everything, and then they're spreading the wrong information with the other students. But it's important to be able, to, you know, to go if you are going to go with video to do cover those basics because again, you you know, it's it's just you want to bring a le level the playing field, uh, as some would say, especially early on in the class, so the basics are all covered. Right. And I think, you know, again, going back to the scripting and storyboard, it helps you to do that. The other thing that's really great is just bouncing it off someone else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you're working with blinders on and you're, you know, you're kind of, and just the idea of saying, well, you know, how do, how do you think this is? I, I'll run something by my wife and she'll be like, well, maybe you should do it this way. And I'll be like, yeah, you know, you're right. So, you know, it's, it's the idea of just don't, don't be in a bubble. Um, and a lot of times you can get the feedback right away from your students, too, when you, when you roll these things out. And that's mm -hmm. what, you know, will help you to fine tune them. Actually, that's another point I missed. Is actually, um, is is video the right medium for whatever it is that you're trying to convey to your students? So also, even keeping that into consideration, you know, uh, you know, if you are going to use video, you know, it's, it is a form of a passive approach, a passive learning. You know, so if it's something that you want them to to learn through hands-on activity, like active learning approach, you know. Video might not be the best for that type of thing. So also also consider using other things, and uh, other than video, if it if, if it requires you know going out there, you you want them to go out in the street, take some pictures of you know modern architecture, you know, and then bring it back and then share with the class, you know, things like you, that require active learning where it takes the student away from the computer and actually doing something. Uh, right. So always right. So keep. Keeping that in mind is also uh, important. So, Michael, what about uh, making the videos engaging? You know, uh, it, it, what are some strategies that professors can use uh, to keep students engaged in your lecture videos? Yeah, well, I think you want to make them as you know fun. I think you talked about the idea of making them relatively short. I think is important. Uh, you know, their attention span is going to be you know six minutes. I think is a good good maximum. Um, for you know these atomized videos, and they can always go on to the next one at a, at a, at a later time. Um, I think the delivery too, the idea of just the, you know the the medium how it's changed. I mean, look at a you know a, a film from the 30s, and then look at a YouTube video today, and just the, you know the different the the pace is very different, the mm -hmm. shots are different, the use of music effects, titles, everything is you know much busier today. So, you know, the idea of kind of making a video that has, um, you know, it's shorter, it's tighter, it's paced quickly, um, it's got, you know, punch lines and things like that in it. It might have some interesting kind of little musical cues, like, you know, maybe when you mention an important uh, moment, you support that important moment with uh, text on the screen 
where mm. you're, you know, reiterating an important point, not only speaking it, but also through the caption or even just a, you know, a, a title. Um, and then maybe some kind of overlay, an image, another picture there. So, you know, they, they like things that are in motion and busy and, um, but then again, it's a balance, as we were saying, you don't want to overdo it. I think one of the other things that a lot of people will complain about is um, the music was too loud. So a lot of times when people lay in music, say when they've got narration and they lay in music, um, you know, for instance, I'll see students in their early videos when I'm teaching video production, they'll put in a piece of music that has lyrics. And although mm -hmm. they think they can multitask, you can't listen to the lyrics and the narrator at the same time. So, <laughs> you know, and even if it's just instrumental, if it's too loud. Uh -huh. And again, going back to producer's bias, when they record it, or even you, when you're recording it, you know what you're saying. So you don't realize, hey, that music might be a little too loud. And you've been editing it, you've been working on it for a while, whereas a student who's watching it for the first and only time they don't know what you're saying, so they mm. really need to focus. And maybe that music should be totally gone at that point where, you know, if, if there's any chance that it might be interfering with your voiceover, um, it's really not effective. And just the idea, I think, also of thinking about each element and saying to yourself, well, why am I putting this element in there? And how is it supporting the overall communication, you know, mm. design and the message? It, you know, is, and a lot of times it's not supporting it. It actually may be detrimental. Right, right. Those are all excellent tips. W one that I, I can add to that lineup of, of, of uh, great tips uh, is w I learned over the uh, pandemic as we were all working remotely, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm at home and I'm live streaming through Collaborate or Google Meet, uh, was that, you know, my kids are at home and, you know, once in a while Rosie will pop in or Joshua would jump in and Daddy, I want some ice cream, I want a cookie. And I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, no, no, not, not, you know, just like, you know, uh, you know, I'm like, no, go away or go do, you know, but it, you know, making it personal. This is who you are. Uh, students are very forgiving. Um, you know, I, I got, I got 20 emails right after that pr workshop that I did and saying, Oh, J uh, Jose, did you give Rosie her cookie? You know, I was like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm expecting emails about the workshop, but they're really, and, you know, and, and then, and, and then the, the future workshop, like, where's Rosie? Where's Joshua? You know, so, so, it's again making it personal. It might be you know a cat or a dog you might have a home or it might be you know something that that's it's who you are and and it's okay to to be human that's that's what we are you know and 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 so don't be too critical of yourself for my for me i I, I hate that I sometimes mumble my words michael I, I hate it you know and I can't hear myself on video because I'm like ah oh, you know I said you know and I wish I'd take it you know I wish I could remove it and edit everything to the, but you know it's it's you can't be just too critical I, I sometimes had trouble when I was you know doing a lot before I used to do a lot more editing and I would it would be hard for me to let go of a video because I would try to make it perfect and Perfect doesn't really exist. It's just, you know, you can do so much, but you have to let it go. And then, but then again, you learn from your response from the students and then you take your. Yeah, they actually, you know, they find it more engaging, right? When your, you know, your, your daughter comes in the shot or the cat walks across the keyboard or something. <laughs> now, obviously, if the cat is going to sit on the keyboard the whole class, that might be a little bit distracting, but you know, <laughs> the idea that you know that that moment that that moment that kind of brings it and it just makes it more candid. It makes it more real life. And then you know, a, a lot of my colleagues too that I've talked about, I'll say to them, you know, well, just do it. You know, that old Nike expression. And they'll be like, well, you know, I don't have the greatest background, or I don't have a microphone, or I don't have lighting. And I'm like, you know what? You don't need it, all that stuff. You, you know, it's, it's you and that's what's going to come through. You know, when you look at a, like a brand video, okay, maybe the first time you put a, you know, a, a brand video out there, you want to have perfection, right? right. So you want to get people, but once you have them in your tribe, let's mm -hmm. say somebody's already made a purchase, you don't have to have the same level of production quality anymore because you've already got, you know, them interested in the material. So, right. you know, you can have a much more kind of candid and uh, casual approach that's still effective. That's such an excellent point. It, it's as long as you have value in what you're saying, your audience is buying into that value, you got them hooked. That's your tribe. That's a great point. Uh, you also mentioned lighting, Michael. So let, this is a great segue now into what should we do before you record? 
right? And so turn the lights so, on. <laughs> <laughs> Literally and figuring, right? You got to turn the lights on because you can't be. You know, you, but, but but no, yeah, that's that's a good point. You want to think think about the room. Where are you going to record? Right. Uh, you know, you, if you have kids or is it noisy? In the you know, you have a highway back there somewhere. Uh, Michael, can you talk about audio? How 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 important is audio to video? Well, you know, I, I think audio is the uh, often the the orphan of a lot of video productions, and you know, I see it a lot of times when students come into the studio to do. Yeah, you know, they're like, okay, camera angles and lighting, and uh, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, oh yeah, we need a microphone, you know, and they don't consider like, you know, what microphone, where we're placing it, how we're applying it and using it. But in the end of it, it's really the audio that is most of the importance of the message. I mean, mm -hmm. watch your favorite movie with the sound down. And you know, right. if you can't, you know, read lips or whatever, you're not really gonna get the plot line. You know, you can't really, you know, get what's going on. So most of the information that you're disseminating is coming through the soundtrack uh, right. when you're doing these, you know, these type of videos. So I think you really have to make sure you're getting good sound. Mm -hmm. um, the ear is much less forgiving than the eye is too. So mm -hmm. that, you know, a bad edit or, a, you know, whatever, a bad lighting can, can you know, but when you have <laughs> bad audio, people are just going to be like, what? And, you know, tune away right away. So um, mm -hmm. you really have to make sure that you can do the best you can with, with, with everything, but certainly the sound. And I think a lot of people take it for granted. So, you know, yeah. uh, the idea, you know. Go ahead. A, a, a quick story on that, Michael, and I, I'm gonna keep, I'll keep it brief, but you know, at the time I was at Columbia, we had these production studios, with lighting and high-end cameras, and we were competing with this professor doing the same MOOC, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, she's filming in her basement and you know, brown background. And you know, here at Columbia, we had like million dollar software and whatever. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, she completely beat us based on <laughs> how she, you know, it was a brown background, you know, but the content that she was delivering was amazing. I mean, her delivery, the analogies that she would make, but we were so focused on getting the lighting correct. So again, you know, it, it's really important to focus on the essentials like audio and, and make sure your light is on, like Michael said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you want to make sure your light's on. I know you have some some sample shots there that are really good about you know the idea of the background and uh, the uh, the angle of you know. So here we have you know the the idea of uh, lights in the background, not the greatest, right? It makes you look like a silhouette. Um, so you know, if you have obviously the best thing to do is not shoot against a bright background. Uh, bright windows in the background tend to be distracting. They make you look dark. Um, on the picture on the right, it, there's still a bright background there, but there's a lot of front lighting. And that front lighting, you know, brings the subject to life. And that's what you want. Um, if you're using a webcam where you have very little control over things like exposure, the camera just looks at the overall image. So if you have like on the left, that bright window in the background, it says, I need to expose for that. And mm -hmm. it makes everything else look dark. So a neutral mm -hmm. background, a darker background is probably going to work better than a brighter background. And, uh, you know, I know yesterday you said the, the thing about you know, someone having a television in the background. Well, that's, you know, obviously right. going to be continually distracting because it's mm -hmm. not only bright, but it's constantly moving and changing. So, right. um, you know, you can't, you, can, you, know, you, want, you want to obviously focus their attention on what you want them to look at. Um, go back to the other pictures there and you can see some of the things about sight lines. Um, yeah. You know, the idea of uh, propping up your laptop so that you are, um, you know, basically on eye level with your camera is important, right, with that. So um, angles, if you can see my image, too, you can see, like, if I shoot down on myself, I make myself look, you know, like a little kid, maybe. And, you know, who's going to listen to a little kid or buy something or, you know, whatever from it doesn't give you the credibility. So by shooting up, it, it actually you know, makes you look a little more powerful. But on the other hand, you don't want to shoot up where you're getting what I call a nose cam, right? If people can see, you know, right up your nose or, um, you know, the other, the other idea is um, don't use your laptop on your lap. Um, I've seen, you know, instructors produce videos like that. And when you're sitting with your laptop on your lap, every little shake you look at my image again, right? So I'm, I'm just, you know, kind of emulating here what it might be like if I'm sitting with my laptop while I'm teaching. And every time I shuffle around, the whole image is shaking all over the place. Um, and then think about the negative space in your image. I think a lot of times people don't realize, and you know, you'll see a shot like this 
hi everybody, you know, and you, you know, you've got all this empty space above you or not enough space or, you know, too much space on one side or whatever. So, you know, you want to frame yourself in a pleasing, think of yourself as a newscaster, you know, that kind of image where you're, you know, yeah, this is a beautiful shot here. She's taking up most of the screen. Her eyes are on the upper third. She's not dead center, so it doesn't look like a mug shot. You know, it's, it's, it's actually a, a very pleasing composition. And yeah. a lot of times, too, you know, students might not be looking at it and saying, oh, you know, there's too much headroom. But subconsciously, they're like, something's not exactly right with this shot. And if something is not exactly right subconsciously, it may affect the rest of the, uh, you know, the the uh, the educational, the, the learning, you know, connection that they're like, well, maybe something's not right about what they're saying, too. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so the idea is you want to obviously package it as professionally and cleanly as you can. Although, you know, again, you don't need to rent a million dollar studio to do it. Oh, no. I mean, you can you can have a little light, a lamp or something that you can prop in front of you and so that the light can bounce off your face and so you're well lit as opposed to how Michael said this is per this person was backlit. Right. Um, and uh, here are some, you know, there, there are microphones that you can purchase. Uh, you know, I think this is the blue, uh, the snowball, I think. This is the Yeti. So the Yeti, they're, they're, yeah. they're nice. Yeti, right? Very yeah. good. Two nice mics. You know, obviously the, uh, an extension mic is going to give you better quality than you're going to get in your built laptop screen, the microphone that's embedded in there. Yeah is not really, you know, the, the greatest quality, although again, it is acceptable. Um, one of the things that I, I don't know, we didn't mention this yesterday, but I, I, I don't do it enough myself, but um, it's a good idea actually to put down, say, a towel underneath your laptop if you are using your uh, built-in microphone, because what happens is when you're speaking, you get these reflections off the table and you might mm. sound a little bit more kind of, you know, open or ambient so that towel on the table will deaden those reflections and it'll actually make you sound cleaner so i mean there's all kinds of tricks obviously to optimize you know and i, I always tell students well you know in a photography class if i and they'll be like well what camera are we using is that the mm -hmm. latest and the greatest camera and i'm like <laughs> you know well, if i gave you know ansel adams you know this toy camera he'd do a great job so, you know, you don't really, you know, it's only a tool. And again, it's, it's really, you know, the, the preparation, the writing, the content that's really going to, you know, facilitate the, the learning here. So, Exactly. That's a great point. Um, real quick, we're going to talk a little bit about captions and why it's important to have captions in your videos. I know uh, there are uh, schools like um, uh, Berkeley, NYU have recently been sued for, for not having captions. Uh, on their videos. Um, I, I think MIT Courseware had to take down almost, I forget, but it was a, a big chunk of all their free courses online because of, you know, they, 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 they didn't, the videos didn't have captions. And so they were told, well, if you don't have captions, you got to take down the videos and they had to take down. I mean, it's, it's sad to hear that, but, but you also got to see it from the other side, which is inclusive teaching. Everyone should, um, you know, those who with a disability should be able to also enjoy these videos. So for us at FIT, uh, we um, purchased um, tools and also um, captioning service for you that's available to you. Um, and the reason why I mentioned captions at first is because uh, there are such things called standalone videos. And what standalone videos is, it basically anytime you upload a video directly to Blackboard, that's what's considered a standalone video. And and the reason why we give it that name is because um, the video doesn't have any captions. If if you upload directly to Blackboard, Blackboard would, will not caption those videos for you. Like YouTube would auto-generate the captions, Screencast-O-Matic would you know generate captions, Scre uh, uh, VoiceThread would generate captions. So the school has made a priority to focus on, on being ADA compliant on videos and, and, and also the website itself. Um, Michael, any ideas, any, any tips for captions and, and such? Yeah, well, you, you need to have them, I think. And, uh, you know, not only for students with disabilities, uh, I think that captions also, you know, help just to reinforce the message. A lot of times, you know, you're, you're listening, you're reading at the same time. So you're getting, you know, both versions of that multimedia experience and they're synchronized so close that 
you know, it kind of hits home better. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I find even when I'm watching, you know, videos, I like to put the captions on uh, just to get that that benefit and, uh, you know, to, to have it come together like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they are easier to do. You know, years ago, you had to, you know, type them up and stuff. And, uh, you know, you would have even, you know, services where people would do transcriptions for you. And um, today they're, you know, pretty much auto generated and, uh, you know, they're, they're a lot easier to apply them. So. Yeah, and I gotta say they've gotten much more accurate. Um, YouTube, I, I would say, is pretty, pretty, really good. Uh, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint also has live captioning. Google Meet ha- now has live captioning. Yeah, uh, it, it also is great for students who, who like, we have a lot of students from Korea and China who, where English is not their first uh, language, and so having the captions for them, it, it, it might be easier for them to understand what it is that you're saying. Sometimes we might speak a little bit too fast for them. And so, so they will turn on the captions, or they might even download the captions uh, mm-hmm. for that, right, uh, Michael, yeah. as, as, a, as, a, as a way to complement their right. study, like a study it's guide. Like, it's their, their takeaway, right? They can have their takeaway, you know, and then if they want to do some more reading or use that as a study guide, exactly, to kind of, uh, you know, use it for their, their lecture notes or whatever, the captions really is a, it's, it's a script into itself. Yeah, uh, I just want to mention one last thing before we, we go into the Q&A is down here at the bottom. And by the way, I hope you all were able to access this document. I, I'll put the link again in the in the chat room. But down here, I have an ex, a video exhibition. This is where you all are going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, putting your videos in so that we can all look at it. And it, it's, a, it's a link to a Padlet. And um, hopefully by our second workshop, uh, you all will be able to come into this Padlet and put, post the links to your videos. Yeah. Jose, there was someone, I think Shelly had a, a problem accessing it. I just saw, I saw her message twice, actually. She had a oh. problem accessing the... Uh, oh, the, the, the presentation. Let me go ahead and copy that one more time. Sorry, Shelly, let me... Let me no, that's okay. That. It just keeps... Uh, it's in a circular motion, a never-ending circular motion of nothingness. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I've been... Oh, you know, I see that, too, actually, now that I look at it. it's That's strange. Oh, well, no, wait a second. It's... Let me copy and sometimes that. Sometimes Spark takes a little time to load. It gives you a, a yeah, couple Yeah, I did it a couple tips. times. Yeah. That's if you're giving you those tips on the bottom, the blue text that says try sharing visuals, and it's just, it's just kind of continually looping those tips over and over again. I'm sorry about that. I must have copied yeah. the wrong. Let, let's try this link. Does this one work, Shelly? Yes, it does. Sorry about that. That was my mistake. I must have. Yeah, that's okay. I have everything. So now I can just save this link, right? Yes, you can. You can bookmark it uh, because we're going to be working. uh, We're going to be working uh, completely off this document. We're going to all the recordings that Michael and I have done. We're going to chunk them up and we're going to do a little bit of editing and we're going to put these back in so that you can always go back and reference to what we spoke about today. Uh, it could be used as a resource or, or a study, you know, material for you or, or just to recap or summarize what we talked about today. Uh, and also for you to access the Padlet where we're all going to, you know, by workshop two, we, we would all film our intro or lecture videos. And then we're going to use that footage to then edit um, and use it as a, a material to edit later on in workshop number two. That's great. Any questions for us? Um, as we're here, hey, Michael, go ahead, Mike. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I, I have nothing right now. I, I just. Oh, no, sorry. The no, Michael, is Michael, that, is that another Michael? Yeah, Michael. Yes, another, yeah. another Michael. <laughs> I, I was unable to do, to learn video. We had a one hour session last summer. So I taught this fall, last fall, very successfully with, I made PowerPoint presentations that I, 50 of them, that for mm-hmm. three classes, that I then, I would I would start the lecture and record it, and then I would present the video, um, the PowerPoint, and speak over it, and sometimes I made it interactive. I hmm. asked them if they had questions before I went to the next slide. I confess hmm. to being, um, very confused, not because of your presentation, my inability mm-hmm. to, it's as if you're speaking a foreign language and I'm confused mm-hmm. about what we're doing in the fall. If mm-hmm. we're going back in person, 
how, what are what are we doing with all these videos? Aren't we yeah. teaching them in person? Oh no, yeah, that's a great question, uh, uh, Alexandra. The, yeah. the w with videos, and, and the reason why we decided to to do this is was because you know, as you said, dur during the uh, pandemic, the remote teaching, and then there's like a curveball. <laughs> we all had to just adjust quickly and figure this out. Uh, and then now that we're transitioning back into the classroom, we got a lot of feedback from faculty saying, "Wow, you know, these videos." It's working. I'm getting great feedback from students. You know, how, how can I use video that I videos that I created during this remote teaching, and how can I how can I reuse and repurpose them now as I we're teaching in the face to face classroom? And so the idea, uh, which is not a new idea, it's the flipped classroom approach, which has been has been used for several years now, and and has proven to be very highly successful. Uh, method of teaching where you give students the videos of the lectures ahead of time. The students watch the videos on their own time. I like to call it on your own time, it's like a homework assignment. And what, what it's doing is now the students can watch, rewatch, pause, rewind those videos. And what, it, what, it, what it's doing is now that it's, it's freeing up this time that you that you would then use to do more of group activities or or more of a one-on-one -on -one with your students. You know, you can talk to them now. Now you have this free time where you can actually do other things that you really would like to do with your student that otherwise you would have to spend two hours just lecturing the time. And so that's what kind of led to this workshop. And Michael, I don't know if you want to add to that, Michael. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I would, you know, say that the the face of production obviously has changed because of the pandemic, you know, and, you know, to use a, a hackneyed phrase, the new normal. So I think we have to kind of, you know, think about this for our, you know, our, our approach to teaching. And just imagine if before the pandemic, you would have had, you know, an archive of videos that would be already, you know, ready to go. And mm -hmm. uh, when we all of a sudden we got thrown into, you know, working remotely, we would have these things ready to go already. That's my dog, Nikki. <laughs> um, and, you know, like just recently, uh, a student uh, yeah, asked me in my online class, um, and it could have been a face to face class too, Nikki, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure how to set up the pivot table, say, but I have a video for that already in my archive. So I just said, you know, here's a link. Take a look at this and let me know if you have more questions afterwards. And afterwards, I got an e email saying, that was great. I completed the assignment. Can you check it for me? And I think they got above a 90. So just the idea that, you know, you have this archive ready to go as a resource for students that you can use or not use, um, right. you know, and depending on, you know, all kinds of different situations. So, and I think the, you know, what Jose said as, as a, as a, you know, a primer, it really helps them to, uh, you know, know what to expect when they come into the classroom. They've, and, and, and a lot of the road things, and it depends on the curriculum, but if there's a lot of road things that you're showing them, like maybe in some of the labs, you know, how to thread the machine or something like that. So instead of going over that, you know, for each student, because they all can't see it well, you know what I mean? Right. The idea of doing a video where every one of them is in the first row now, looking at it right up front, um, and they can see that, and they're like, oh, now I know what you mean by, you know, threading the spindle or whatever it is. or. You know, whatever. So the idea of, you know, I think using video where it, it's going to be effective is, is the key. I mean, it shouldn't really just be, oh, now we got to make videos, you know, and you certainly you don't want to have, you know, a total video class. We were kidding around about it yesterday where, you know, you tell the student, well, I'll send you a video or whatever, or the whole class is on video. You know, obviously you want to make sure that you have that human connection and engagement too, but I think, you know, video is a support tool. And if it's used wisely, it can be very effective. And of course, you know, it, it takes a while to learn it too, Alexandra. So the idea of, you know, you can't learn it in an hour. I think it's something that, you know, even people like Steven Spielberg will be like, gee, I could have done that better afterwards. So the <laughs> idea is you just have to, you have to do this all the time. You have to just be kind of always immersed in it. And the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Obviously, if you don't do it, right. you're not, you know, you're never going to get to that point. So, and, and I, you know. I think the idea of just you know saying I'm going to do it is the, the first step. 
Right, right. Michael, thank you. May I just say one thing though? Like I'm teaching two very advanced seventh semester classes in the fall, and it is four hours of information. Right. And I find it's very interactive. I am introducing a subject to them that they don't know. So they have to ask a lot of questions as I'm giving them information. So right. I'm concerned about providing a video and then how am I teaching them this new language? Because they don't know this aspect of fashion. It's very advanced, it's very unique, and it's very specific to intimate apparel. It's as right. if I'm teaching a new language. Right. But you know, you know, I can understand, that and it, I'm not an expert in that that curriculum, and I can I can relate to the idea that you know it might be something that is much more effective in a face to face environment. It's kind is. of like a driving instructor, right? You can watch that, you know, you know mm -hmm. that insurance video where you know defensive driving, but there's nothing like actually getting in the car with the instructor that you're going to be there, you know, face to face, you know, exactly. in real time. That's going to teach mm -hmm. you. So you know, that's it. You got to, you know, you got to be in the driver's seat. And it depends, I guess, on the curriculum and the, you know, the the uh, the student and the the professor and all, all those, you know, what they're taking to the the party to make it really work. Um, when you were just describing the idea of a four-hour class where you're disseminating all this new information, what I was saying in my head was it would be great if you had a, you know, a videographer there who was kind of shooting all of this as it happened. And then be able to kind of take a look at that and edit something down again, maybe for a student who was absent for that day. And how could you say, you know, how could you still, you know, bring them up to speed if they were absent the day and they missed all that great, you know, uh, you know, kind of presentation that you did live? But you, now you've got that video archive for that particular student who was sick that day. Can so, the college you know, help us and and with video with someone to video us as we're lecturing? That's a good question. That's a good question. I mean, there is media yeah. services. I mean, I think they'd be a little overwhelmed in helping everyone. So I think, you know, the idea of helping each, helping ourselves as much as possible is probably good and, you know, workshops like this. But, yeah. you know, in a really critical thing, I think you could probably book, you know, uh, media services to come and they're professionals and they'd be able to cover the action if you had a real, you know, an intense event or whatever. Mm. All right. I, I know. I, I know Michael K is uh, uh, patiently waiting for her to ask a question, but uh, uh, Professor Alexandra, we, uh, I can always we can talk to me and Michael uh, Coquino, Professor Coquinos, and uh, I know the the media services. I know they are a little bit overwhelmed, but I know you can book them. But I can give you some ideas, and we can talk more on that. Uh, and Michael Thank can also you. give you ideas. Thank yeah, you. and you know, I I would love to be able to help you too. And a lot of times, you know, um, if it works well. Can you come to my well, class? <laughs> Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the idea of having my students work with you, I think, is, is yes, you know, that's another great, great you know, networking thing where students work with students from other departments and they, you know, work together and they can really, you know, uh, kind of visualize, you know, where you have the design students, say, doing something and then the video students are kind of, uh, you know, covering that and they, you know, they, they come out with an interesting product working together. They learn from each other a lot. Yeah, we, we got to talk about that, uh, Michael, about that. But let's go ahead with Michael, uh, the other Michael. Sorry, <laughs> who has a question. I know he's been patiently waiting. Go ahead, Michael. Hi, Michael. <laughs> okay. okay, so I have a couple questions. One is captions has totally freaked me out now because I have all my videos done. I'm teaching the exact same class this fall that I taught last. I had my partner with me who was my videographer. Now I don't have him. I'm not going to start retaping videos again. It would be insane. Um, mm -hmm. My students, it's a four hour class twice a week as well. It's intense. It's beginning draping two jackets. It's uh, for one year students. So if I have my videos, the first question, if I have my videos and they're on my Google Drive, can I send those somewhere else to be captioned? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that because <laughs> we're, that's exactly what we're going to cover later on, too. We're going to. So don't need to worry. That's the first thing I got to say to you, uh, Michael. Don't need to worry. You, uh, we, we've, the school has invested a lot of money in making sure our videos get captioned. So we do have the services for you to just do that. And I'm glad you asked that because uh, I can help you uh, take those videos from Google, from your Google Drive. We can bring them over into either Screencast-O-Matic or I can put them in YouTube. Uh, we can make them unlisted auto-generate the captions, and you're, you'll be good to go. So don't worry about that. You're in, you're in a good place. Okay. 
that <laughs> totally freaked me out because I was like, if I had to do an eight-hour class once, like four hours twice a week, that's a lot of knowledge. Michael, I can't hear you. I can't hear you when you're speaking. Uh, um, can everyone else hear me? I don't know yes. if it's my Yes, computer. you're a little bit low, Michael. If you can get maybe closer to your mic. I think it also has to do with your internet. Might be a little... Yes, something is I'm not on, coming I'm through. On my iPad. I'm on an iPad. Um, the other, that's another question I had. My, I, my, I, my, my MacBook Pro broke on me this last term. And I had to continue teaching through this iPad Pro that isn't as effective. When I asked my department chair about getting a, an iPad a MacBook or something, because I'm an adjunct, it was a no-go. I paid four hundred dollars to have my computer fixed. Then I also paid two hundred and fifty dollars for a Bluetooth microphone because after I did my first set of videos at the beginning, uh, my phone microphone wasn't strong enough. So I had a whole shot there down the tubes, had to go redo the whole lesson again and go to B&H and buy a Bluetooth microphone. It's like the costs are so prohibitive to someone that's an adjunct who's getting, right. you know, it's almost like you're getting shafted. Um, you can use your phone. You can use this. You're using my internet. I'm using all of this. It's, it's a real kind of problem, right. um, especially when money's really, really tight. So I well, wanted to bring I'm, that I'm, up as well because yeah, right. that's a great that's know, a great question, Michael. Earbuds, the earbuds were a joke. Those earbuds that the school supplied were a joke. They didn't work. They didn't. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm glad you came because I wish I'd known you before. I don't think we've ever met, but I wish I wish you and I had con connected because I I could help you with m many of those things. Also, the I, uh, IT department, and I, I invited um, Rick Orr uh, to come because they, they are going to be giving a, a loaners. They're going to be giving out uh, iPads, mini iPads. Um, I'm not, I don't know th the, the specifics of this program, but um, I'm going to try to have Rick or come to maybe the third workshop to talk about the loaner program. They're going to give out equipment. I know they gave out tripods and camera last semester. Um, so, Michael, I, I'll try to connect you and I'll try to get you some, uh, you know, try to get you on that list of um, for the iPad minis. Is that, you know, that that helps you in any way? Well, or, I have an know. iPad. I have an oh. iPad mini. I have an iPad Pro. I have two iPad minis. That wasn't the issue. It was when you're on an iPad teaching, it's different than being on a, on a MacBook Pro. Right. right. Me. It, you know, you couldn't I couldn't even share videos properly on the on the iPad. The students oh, were like, you want an iPad? And they knew more than I did. I was like, yeah, they're like, it's not working, professor. Oh, yeah. And I had to borrow a neighbor's iPad Pro up in the penthouse of my building. I had to beg her to borrow her iMac, her MacBook. So I, yeah. I shouldn't have to be borrowing stuff from a neighbor to teach for FIT. Right, That's, right. You know, right. It's, there's yeah. like a little bit of a thing in my throat on this aspect. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. You had to go through them, uh, Michael. Uh, I will connect it to Rick Orr because they also do have laptops. Um, That's so, uh, great. Yeah, uh, Eleanor, you have a question? Yes. No. I. Um, hi, everyone. I just wanted to. Um, I just wanted to uh, let, let everyone know, especially Michael. I, I serve on the faculty senate as an adjunct adjunct representative, and um, there was a discussion about funds available because of the pandemic, uh, college funds. So that's an issue that's on still on the table. And I would highly recommend that, uh, you know, you come to the next faculty Senate general meeting. Uh, you know, I serve on the executive committee, but um, that's an issue that we, you know, we talked about that the adjuncts in particular need, uh, you know, reimbursement because I myself spent a lot of money. I bought a new iMac. Um, which has, you know, served me very well. Um, but we need support, monetary support, for this technology so that we can do what we need to do for our students. Yeah. So I much, I much come to the faculty senate, general faculty senate meeting where we can discuss this. And, and Michael, Eleanor's a great connection. I mean, she, she, uh, I mean. Uh, 
Eleanor, what you've done with your course, Eleanor teaches dance and she's been using video in, for her course. And so, you know, you're already, you know, over, over the pandemic, remote teaching, you, you've done so much work. And I'm, I just wanted to mention that. I don't want to, <laughs> to embarrass you, but I just wanted to mention how great your work has been during, you know, with video production and your course. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Jose, may I say one thing? A lot of faculty who were able to video had a partner that videoed them that knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, for me, I don't have that support, and I, I it is so hard for me. I don't have words. It's it's it, it's as if you're speaking not even a foreign language. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, beyond, it's beyond yeah. that. Me. Yeah, For no, me. I, no, I completely understand, Alexandra. And and so one of my goals since I've joined FIT was to to find a space somewhere at FIT. It could be a closet or I don't know. And I was, you know, at Columbia we had this um, uh, uh, a room where a faculty member can come in, and you know there was the equipment was there, the camera, it was all there ready for them. And so I'm still in the yeah, it, it was like a self-serve one shop stop for video production because it's hard to find a space where you can actually do this. I mean, if you go to the CET, there's a bunch of faculty around you and a lot of people are talking. So it's hard to even film in the CET. And my office is too tiny. I, I'm almost in a closet and I share with another person. <laughs> So you know, you know, you know, Alexandra, you know what I'm talking about. So, so I've been searching, and if anybody knows of a room that we can dedicate towards faculty, I mean, online law, online learning department is willing to spend. You know, I I bought the camera for it. I bought a la an iPad for it and a laptop. I just need a room where I can just dedicate that to faculty. They can reserve it whenever they want and go in there and just, you know, have a safe space. It's quiet to actually do your own recordings. Well, Jose, that would not only be phenomenal, would be phenomenal if we could have in-person learning with the actual equipment. Oh, that yeah. would be really helpful. I, yep. You know what I always think of? Think of the, 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 the smallest half-hour sitcom, and then it's 10 <laughs> minutes of credits of how many people were involved to accomplish that. Right. Be, it, I think it's a lot to ask us to make a professional looking video for students, which when we all care so much about what we present to them, right. and not a trained videographer. Right, right. Well, th th that oh, was right. the plan. Right. Yeah, Michael, Michael, you want to want to answer that? No, I'm just, I'm just, I, I, you know, I can certainly you know side with what everybody is saying. It's it's not easy. I mean, people have you know worked uh, you know, like you said. You have these huge crews of specialists like walking into a, <laughs> a surgical room, right? Everybody has their own <laughs> thing. All I do is you know place the microphone, and all I do is turn on this light, and you know, and it, it all comes together in the end, right? And it costs lots yep. of money. You know, and we don't have oh, those yeah. kind of resources, so we have to, you know, we have to yeah. do the best we can with what we have. And I think, you know, the idea of just improving on what you have and optimizing with what you have is, a, you know, I think the first step and then taking it to the next level, you know, getting a space. Yeah. And that would be great, um, you know, using the resources, you know, that we have and, you know, building on those resources. Yeah. Well, thank and, you and so, so much. And, really. and, and to your point, Alexandra, you know, this workshop is obviously just the beginning, you know, it's just like, you know, it's a three part series and we're going to, we are going to create video of it, at least one video and then we are going to edit it. Um, but, I, you know, going back to what you said, the idea of having this one room, one stop shop, I, the intention was also to sit down with a faculty member and train them how to use it. Not just here, okay, go ahead and now, you know, it, it doesn't work that way, right? It's, you know, you got to know how to use it and know how to do what you need to do. And so it wasn't just going to be something like that where we're just going to drop you in there and say, okay, here, go ahead, make your own video. You can't. Um, you can't. It's, it's, it's impossible. It's going to be a recipe for disaster. Um, but Jean, Jean has a great question here, Jean Salvatore. She says, I really want to create video but don't know where to start. What is the best program to use on my laptop? And do I need a tripod? So, Michael, you, you want to you wanna, you wanna take this one? Okay. I mean, okay. Well, uh, the first thing I would say is, are you using a Mac or a PC, Gene? How are you, Gene? I'm using a, I'm using a PC. Using a PC. 
So um, on a on a PC, I like if if it was a Mac, I would say you know it, it's iMovie is your you know go to program because um, uh, it comes free with all Apple uh, computers, so you already have it, and it's actually a very powerful editing program. So Windows has a uh, media you know editing tool I think in there too. I'm not as familiar with it. But I would actually look at some of the online um, tools that are available. In fact, Adobe Spark has a video uh, segment too called the Adobe Spark Video, where you can shoot and upload your video and edit it online in the cloud. Um, there's another service called Canva, which also will give you, you know, some editing capability on a, on a free level. There's other ones that you have to pay for too. One is called InVideo, and I think it's more advanced in video. Um, I, I think they have a really great platform. Again, it's all cloud-based, um, so that'll work really good. Um, we can talk some more too, you know, in the background about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, just, I just want to say one, one quick, one quick thing, Jim. In terms of the camera, what do I use the camera on my laptop? I mean, that's what I'm not quite sure. Uh, where yeah, I mean, what 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 I did this semester or last semester with my students was um, I taught them how to use their mobile device. And the camera that's built in your iPhone or, yeah, exactly, you've got a killer camera in there that's better than a lot of the news crews were using 10 years ago. So, you yeah. know, you can shoot 4K video. I would say get a small tripod. Um, you can get a $20 tripod. Um, if you give me a second, I can even show you one real quick. But, you know, it's a little, you know, a little kind of flexi tripod. And you can get a phone mount for that. And you can mount it right where your laptop camera is already and use that, you know. Uh, I think you'd need a tripod um, to do this because handheld, you're always going to be shaking all over the place. So you really need to be able to mount that camera just the way your webcam is obviously mounted so that it's not distractingly kind of bouncing around all the time. But... Um, I had my students do their first project with the webcam, and then we, they did their second project in 4K with their phones, and you could see the difference. It's night and day. Uh, the quality is so much better with the phone. Um, it's a little, you know, it's an extra step or whatever, but um, I think the phone is a great tool to use. And there have been Hollywood movies shot on iPhones. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you have a pretty powerful tool right there. For I, audio. I one, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying for, for sound, too. You can do pretty good sound if, if you, again, optimize it and use it correctly on your phone. You don't think so, Michael? I see you shaking. And no, we, we, <laughs> found that, we found that, that the microphone on the iPhone was not conducive at all. It was so low and dull, you couldn't hear it. And um, I see you have a nice mic there. This Bluetooth yeah. mic at p &H, it's the only one that they had. You know, right. of course, they don't expense a <laughs> um, And you yeah. do finish the class for the, the next day. And we ran yeah. to B&H. Um, yeah. you know, the the problem with the iPhone... Know, I'm sorry, Mike, I don't want to yes. interrupt you. I, was, I, I know what you're saying. You really need a better microphone. But, you know, there are workarounds. One thing that I, I suggest to students who are in a similar situation was use two phones. So what we did is, and see, the iPhone microphone is made to be spoken into like really close. So mm -hmm. if you're shooting video from far away and, uh, you know, the video could look good, but the microphone is so far away. So what you do is you use two phones, one just for the sound and one for the picture. And you run them both at the same time and then you make a sound like, you know, take one like that. And then you mm -hmm. can actually, in an edit program, very easily line them up. So in other words, you'll be shooting me from far away, but I'll have my phone in my pocket for the audio. So this is called double system. And, you know, it's just, it's not as good as your microphone, I'm sure, but it's going to be a lot better than shooting from like, you know, eight feet away with a, with a you know, and thinking you're going to get good audio. The so, only other thing you have to worry about these is that you don't have it on mute and you do oh, your yeah. whole lesson on mute. And then yeah, you play yeah. back your video. <laughs> no, you that could be nightmare. So it's, it's always good. I've been right. through it all. I've been through it it's all. It's always good to do a, a little test, you know, where you would shoot only a one minute piece of say and then play it back and say, uh oh, we need to fix the mic, we need to fix the lighting. Because a lot of times what happens is that you'll spend so much resources and time and have great lighting and all of a sudden find out something like that, you have no sound. So the whole thing is trashed.
Right. I just want to add one quick. I just want to add one quick thing because uh, before before people start leaving, uh, is that uh, Jean's question uh, uh, as to what software should you should you, she should we use um, through this maker series to, through this three part maker series, we're going to be um, learning how to use screencast and matic um, and you know recording and then editing the video. But like Michael said, you can always use other tools. Uh, and the reason, you know, the reason why we're going to use a uh, um, screencast o matic is because the school already has purchase license for all of us. And the other, the other reason is also because we got a lot of good feedback from faculty as to how easy it is to use, to record and edit, and to, you know, recording screencast and uh, recording screen captures or talking heads. So for this right. workshop, we're gonna, you're all going to be able to learn how to yeah. edit using screencast o matic and. Uh, and if you need help um, getting a license and getting signed in, after we're done with Q and A, stay with me, and I can I can I can help you uh, 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 get the license as well as download the Screencast-O-Matic to your computer. Yes, I'm sorry, I, I was remiss actually in Gene's question about Screencast-O-Matic because it actually is a very powerful editing program and acquisition too, and uh, it's um, you know. Fairly easy to use, so I, you know, I should have mentioned that first, and I realized I was, uh, you know, I forgot, Jose. So excuse me. I tried it. And I, I, could not, I could not download it. May I ask a question? Are you? These sessions are going to be offered on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Are you giving? Are you both giving both sessions, Tuesday or Wednesday? Or are you the, only the Wednesday sessions? Oh yeah, so so Michael and I are, are going to tag team. Uh, and Michael, again, I don't know. If, I, I, I'm already, <laughs> I'm already, I'm, I'm already, uh, you know, sign, signing you up already. I don't even know if you're available, but I would love to have Michael back. I mean, I, I guess everyone agrees that Michael's such a great Fabulous. resource. Whenever I'm available, I'm going to be here. Definitely, <laughs> I'm going to be able. I'm going to try to be here for all the sessions. So, so for both us, Tuesday and Wednesday. So. If if I had to sign up for Tuesday next week, you'll both be here. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We'll, 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 most likely. <laughs> no, is I think it's important because I think if a different presenter might be on a different place slightly, oh. and you know the interaction that we've all had, and I'm oh, I will yeah. email you some of my, you know. Uh, oh yeah. Right, for it's kind of be either certainly. Yeah, it's definitely going to be either the two of us, or if Michael can make it, I, I'm definitely not going to, you know, I'll be here. Uh, but it's usually going to be Michael and I, and both for both days. Yeah, and, and just to clear that, just to just to clear that up, we're doing two of the two sessions of the same workshop. Just just in, just if you can't make it in the morning, you can then, you know. So I, I did I do have those two days, and basically this is the second workshop. Oh, sorry, this is the second. Scheduled day to the first workshop, right? And so the next one we're going to have is this is going to be the second uh, workshop. We're going to talk more about production, recording, uh, and those things, and how how to set up, you know, the your your room for the recording process. And then we'll talk more about Screencast-O-Matic. And the second workshop will definitely be more hands-on. Yeah. And Jose, I couldn't even sign up for Screencast-O-Matic, so. But I found oh, I that I actually preferred presenting the PowerPoints as I went along. I did would not have liked pre-recording it and sitting there with the students listening to myself present it. It actually worked for me better not to have that um, that I spoke over it. Right. Ahead right. Of yeah. I think if yeah. you're doing it live, just the idea of being able to, you know, because a student could say something and interrupt you and say, you know, can you go back to something? And obviously in yeah, video, and I did. it's, I, yeah, I, exactly. I did. So, yeah, you yeah, want to be in control. Would so. say, yeah, would you, like, would you like me to go back to, um, you know, the, the, that slide? And because they, they would ask a question, I would go back. It was very interactive. And I, I found I enjoyed the presenting much better than if I had pre-recorded it and was sitting there with them listening. No, you don't want to do that. Definitely not. <laughs> if, yeah. I mean, if you're sitting there with them, I think the idea of, you know, watching a video that you've produced is probably, you know, a little redundant, right? So the idea is 
yes. again, you know, let them see that video before or, say, or see it after. Ahead of time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or refer back to it after if they need a refresher or something like that. But obviously, in a, in a live situation, you want to keep it live. You know, keep it, keep it live, keep it dynamic, keep it interactive, and you know, keep that video for you know the the primer or the you know the debriefing kind of thing. I think. Well, I'm glad better. you were on the same page. No, thank you. That's really that was my instinct to sit there and watch them myself present didn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's it's very contrived that to do it to do yeah, it that way. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, yeah. So nice. Um, yeah, these are, this is great. I mean, this is these are great questions. If, if if there are any more questions, if anyone in here hasn't yet um, obtained a screencast-o-matic license, I'll be happy to um, help you na take the time now and help you uh, acquire a license is is is, is, is that's okay with everyone or is, are there any more questions all right do you need all right, well, to have that on an i an, like a macbook or can you put can you put it on an ipad or does it should it be more or less on the iphone the macbook it should work on any platform okay it's pretty pretty compatible. yeah it should yeah, it, it should work it's really even if. It, yeah, yeah, a PC I think or Mac. Just downloading the recorder, right? The screen recorder is the only download that you have to, you know, the little piece of software, and it'll go on either PC yeah. or Mac. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I just again, I, so I'll, I just want to get. On and get okay. Yeah, I can. I can do one on one. I just want to. I want to thank Michael again, uh, Professor Kokinos, for for taking time. I know you're. Your time is so valuable. I really appreciate you. You're the I, I can't say enough. You know, as you all you all can tell, he is like such a nice guy, and he's he he te he, he speaks at a level that we all can understand. He's not like talking above, like oh you know you know. He's, so he's a great person, and I really yeah, really really recommend. Yeah, it's it's great yeah. working with Jose all the time, and uh, you know with you guys too. I appreciate you know and. Uh, you know, the other interesting thing I just say as an aside is that um, even though the workshop was the same workshop for me, it was very different. You know, and obviously yeah. the different dynamics <laughs> from you guys and you know Jose and I working off each other, but you know different questions and you know it was it was really different. So you know, it wasn't wasn't just like reiterating the same you know hackney thing that we did yesterday. So it was it was fun. That's an excellent point. So if you if you do want to attend both, we almost guarantee you it won't be the same thing. <laughs> the same <laughs> <laughs> Your punishment come Tuesday and Wednesday, right? <laughs> come both days if you want. You're, you're welcome. Hey, we're, we're not going to say no to you. If you want to come both days, you want to hang out with us, we're going to have fun. <laughs> All right, very All good. Right. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to excuse myself and say goodbye. And uh, thank you guys so much. And thank uh, you. I look forward to, to seeing you next week. Jose, if we could, we could talk a little bit between now and next week, too, and, you know, get, our, get our ducks in a row. And... <laughs> <laughs> Get our camera angle straight, right? Oh, All right. right. <laughs> Have a Take great care. day, everyone. Thank you, you guys. You too. Bye bye. Thank you. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop the recording there.